Well, I started a nonprofit in 2007 called Laces. It stands for Life and Change Experience Through Sports. And we develop mentorship-based sports leagues as a way to teach children morals and values based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. Our overall vision is we want to rise up positive role models. We work in Liberia, West Africa only. We started right when Liberia had come out of a 14-year civil war where many children, 15,000 is the estimate, were child soldiers. And we're not talking about people who were, you know, 14, 15, 16. We're talking about 8, 9, 10 year olds who were former child soldiers and the war had ended and there's a, a need for restoration in that country. I, I guess the, how did laces get started might help a little bit. Um, in 2005, I, oh no, you can go back. <laughs> there you go. In 2005, I was an athletic trainer, and that's my degree. I was working at Northwestern University, and I hated my job and hated my life. So I just, <laughs> I so I knew I needed to make a change, so I just quit my job. I gave my standard two weeks notice, and with nothing else to do, no other job lined up, because I didn't want to do what I was doing then. I heard about this organization called Mercy Ships, and they convert old cruise liners into hospitals. Uh, all right, let's let's just leave. Let's go somewhere else for six months, figure out, try to help out, and do the opposite of what I was doing in life at that particular moment. So I boarded the ship in Liberia, West Africa. And I'd been there for about, they did some orthopedic work, and so I was working with their, um, doing physical therapy and athletic training with the, the children who were getting orthopedic surgeries. So I was on the ship for the first two weeks, and then I hopped off the ship, and I was playing in a pickup soccer game. And as I was out there, and someone saw me playing, and they recruited me to play in their women's professional soccer league. So I played professionally in Liberia for about a total of six months. And that's really where I got connected to the culture, it was right after the war. The thing that stuck with me the most was I was at a practice one day, and um, you know, just uh, practicing, I guess, and the girls always showed up late. And you know, in the States, they like, show up on time, you have your cleats, you have everything, like you're ready to go. If not, like you're sitting on the bench. Good luck next practice. Well, girls would show up late, they wouldn't have their kit on, they, um, sorry, that's a British term, they didn't have their uniform on and things. And then, they, you know, coach would say jump, and they would say hello, he'd say run, they would walk. It was just driving me crazy how disorganized it was, and so I went up to the coach one day in my very arrogant way and was like, why do you allow this to happen? This is not the way sports should be. And he very quickly put me in my place, and he just said, these women have been through 14 years of civil war. This is their only outlet each day to enjoy themselves. He's like, I'm just happy that, I, that they come. It's not about sports right now. Like, All right, fair enough. And that really taught me a lesson, taught me the value that sports can have. When I played sports, I played in, you know, all through high school, played in college, and all sports to me was a game. And I wanted to win that game, and I wanted to play well, and I wanted to be the best at it. So when I went to college, I chose a university, a Christian university, not because I was a Christian. It was because I knew I could start my freshman year, and somebody was going to pay for me to play. <laughs> and so I was, I was quite happy about that. And then I had a coach there. He invested in me, and he spent time with me, and that's when I became Christian. He taught me what it was like to live a Christ-like life. He taught me that sports had more than just, you know, numbers and, and playing games and um, winning. I mean, that was a huge thing, that sports had more than just winning for me. So I took all of those concepts and thought about, you know, Liberia and this war-torn country and restoration, and, you know, all around me, watching kids play soccer and seeing what the coach said to me and listening to him saying, look, it's not about the game right now. This is about rebuilding. So I went back to the States with, um, you know, just a burden on my heart. And God put this passion and this idea together for me, which was laces. And we teach values such as that are inherently in sports, and I think everyone here can kind of agree, self-esteem, respect, discipline. We included the living gospel. We had morals and values, and I didn't want them to be my morals and values when I have a Bible that can tell me exactly what that is, and I want it to be based on those beliefs. 
So in 2007, I went into Liberia on my own again um, and lived there for two years. In the first year, we, next slide, we worked with 182 children and we had 30 coaches. Basically, we trained these coaches on how to mentor children. And to be honest, over time, we got, we got pretty good at our mentoring side. And what we've come to realize over time is actually our sports side wasn't as strong. It's, um, we're getting there, but mentoring was our, our big thing. So we spent a lot of time not just, we're not going to show up to practice. We're not going to just play. We're going to be intentional about this opportunity that we have. So in, this is what we did in 2007, and five years later, we have worked with over 610 children, we trained 114 coaches, and we employ 12 people in an un <coughs> unemployment rate of 85%. Next slide. Our philosophy, what, why do we do what we do? And over time, it became this community development model. We wanted to empower locals, we wanted to strengthen the family unit, which had been severely broken because of the war. We wanted to build stronger communities that had been broken because of the war. And provide an environment where children can grow and become great leaders in a way that's fun for them. So keeping these ideas in mind, we built a program and we continue to fine tune it. Nothing is ever right the first time around. We've made mistakes, we've learned from them, and we've seen successes from it. And that's basically what I'm going to talk to you about more, is some of our uh, lessons learned and our critical successes. Liberia is a, um, is a very negative culture. Um, they went through 14 years of civil war, and so everything was driven, if I'm more forceful than the other person, then what I want will be done. And, you know, every, there's a little negative, you know, people fight in general, but this was really embedded into the culture at this point which from my understanding was not the cultural norm prior to the war. So LACES really had to create an environment that was positive reinforcement. We have something in our coaching manual that says 50 ways to say very good. And it's a bit funny, you know, all of our coaches kind of laugh at us. And then we make them add 10 other ways that they would say very good to it as well. And one day after doing this, one of the coaches finally came to me and he's like, can you tell us five ways to say very bad? And I was like, no, I think we got that one down. Like, let's work on the very good and let, let's work on this. And so what has come from this is that our children, because of this positive reinforcement, because of this shift, our children feel like someone hears them, someone sees them. Um, that they are loved, and that someone is paying attention to them and cares about what they do. And these kids aren't just like, um, you know, misbehaving. We have kids who do drugs, we have kids who are stealing, we have kids who are drinking. We work with kids aged 10 to 14. I'm talking about our kids who are aged 10 and 11 who enter our program and this is their daily life. So once we've done the positive reinforcement, what has come from it is that um, through research that we've done recently, and I'll touch on that more in a little while, LACES children, you know, there's still physical violence. I mean, they're not immune to that. But when compared to other, their peers, LACES children have, um, they tend to end fights quicker. This is an independent researcher informing us of this. They're more inclined to stop fights between others. LACES children more observe to involve adults when conflicts do start, such as their coaches, mentors, people they respect. And LACES children were observed to stop fights between children who are not in our program. It's interesting when you look at a program from year one, because children stay in our program for four years, we're not just one hit kind of thing, not a, not a weekend. We know that children don't change overnight. So we keep them in this very formative stage where they're making personal decisions. So year one, when you look at a program, because it's a negative culture, but that doesn't, our coaches still have that mentality. So when you see a program year one, you see some of that physical abuse between the kids, the conflict, you get a negative speak from the coaches. And then by year four, you start to see not, not only through the laces program are children being transformed for the future, but the current leaders are, because they found a new way to reach out to children. Our national director was here in the States last um, April. 
was here for a whole month doing fundraising with us. And by the end of that month, I just, you know, what was, what, what are you taking away from the most from this? And he said, I'm going to love my children more. I've seen the way that children are when they're loved more. And this is our director who really mm -hmm. holds the passions of laces. And he was around families that really love their children here in the States. And he's like, this is what I want for my family now. So some of the lessons that we learned, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, um, which we, you caught it before we did, for sure. Um, volunteerism in post-conflict areas. We thought our coaches, people showed this interest. They wanted to rebuild their country. This was an overall vision that the president of Liberia, she had you know, laid out for people, and they, they wanted to come alongside. So we, you know, but a majority of the population lives below the, the poverty line, which means shelter, food, clothing, basic needs are not being met. And we found that to be a, a challenge in our program, but we continued to just be on this drum over and over, volunteerism. And then it backfired in our faces. So we had a program in the first year that was going really well, and our second year, it was, it was going okay, and then by the third year, um, we showed up to you know, and our coaches kept telling us, you know, we need stipend, we need stipend, this is really hard for us to do, but no one listening. And then by the third year, they just stopped showing up. And we, which was interesting, they just, they kind of went on strike a little bit. They were trying to make a point to us, and it was, it was well received. Um, and we showed up to a gang one day, and there were, there were no coaches. We had our coordinators there, who, who we do pay, who managed the game. Now, the interesting part about that, so I was, um, you know, this is now that I've been back in the States, so I'm hearing this information. But this is while our researcher was there. And one so our coaches... Oh, one minute left. Okay. <laughs> All right. So our coaches didn't um, show up, but what we learned from that is that our coaches genuinely needed to be paid and that this was a value that we needed to, to give to them. Um, all right. Let's go to family support. We're going to skip over coaches' support a little bit. Uh, no, we'll go back. There we go. Uh, family support. We needed the parents. We wanted to improve family um, cohesiveness. We needed the parents involved. So we started to, you know, talk about the LACES program and, and meet with them. And, but what we found out is parents still weren't were coming out. They weren't invested in this. And we couldn't figure out why. This was a great idea. Why wouldn't they be excited about it? Well, we've come to learn that sports actually had a negative connotation in Liberia football, or soccer particularly. It was either seen as Something that were played for people who weren't smart was a big issue of it, especially with children. Or it was thought, thought as something that they were going to rise up and they were going to make a living from it. So when parents who thought they were going to rise up and not make a living from it weren't seeing that in our program, like, why would we let our kid be there? So what we did was we started going on home visits. So our coaches go and visit the kids' parents every single week. They take another child, different child, they go into the parents' home and say, how can we help you? How can we be part of this? What can we do together? And because of that, parents started coming out to games. We then now have principals of schools who come to us and say, hey, this kid, you know, we're having a hard time. Because people trust us and they know that we're invested in them. Um, next slide. Local leadership, that has been our critical success factor. LACES is around 100% by locals in Liberia. There's not an expat that is there. I left in December of 2008, and it's been running without them since. They've expanded it to 600 kids now on their own, and I obviously provide some support from the U.S., but most of be fundraising now. And what we found from that was they were able to meet the needs of people. They understood what was going on. They understood the struggles, and they were able to help address them in a more timely manner than had we had expats in place who don't understand what it was like to be in a 14-year civil war. Um, we'll go on to the, the research and you can just stay there with that. I want to be a huge advocate here for research. We, through our research, we found out our strengths and our weaknesses. And because of that, like sports, sports for development, I mean, we're, we're up and coming, right? This is, a, this is a big field that's starting to take off and we need credibility behind us. We need to not just say like, Hey, we can start a program and saying we're doing all of these great things. But if we want our field to be taken seriously, we need to provide the information for people to know that we are serious about what we do. And I want to encourage you guys, if you're not doing it, we have taken away so much from it. 
Because of the research, we're rebuilding an entirely new curriculum for ourselves. We've taken um, a woman who has her master's in sports for development and psychology. We're partnering her with um, a professional soccer coach out of the UK. And the two of them, along with our local staff, are going to, in June, going to rewrite our entire curriculum. Um, we are now going to baseline test every single one of our programs over the next three years. And they will be retested year after year. We want to be able to know where we can invest in our kids more, how we can support them more, and be able to contribute to the sports for development community overall. Because, you know, just in this room alone, I'm hearing great ideas from you. And we're hearing great things from everyone else. And we want to be a contributor to that. Because what we're doing is important and it's valuable. And we're attesting to that today. Um, so next slide. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's what we do. That's what we base things on. And those are our kids. They're super cute, so I want to show them to you. 